Well, good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad that you have joined together with us this morning as we worship our great and mighty God. To those of you worshiping with us this morning in person, welcome. We are so glad to have you back in the Lord's house with us today. 
And as always, please help us keep everyone safe by always wearing your mask while in the building and observing social distancing. If you're watching us online this morning, we extend an, ex an extra special welcome to you as well. We'd love for you to communicate with us and with one another during this morning's gathering by using the comments feed on this video or by sending us a private Facebook message or by emailing us at faithful60108 at gmail.com. This morning, the writer of Hebrews reminds us that Jesus Christ is the only great high priest. He stands before God, his Father, to plead for those who love and trust him. When God declares our sin against us, Jesus pleads for our forgiveness. That's what Jesus' death means for us. Forgiveness, mercy, peace, and grace are ours because Jesus was faithful and took the punishment he did not deserve. He suffered in our place and he died for our sake. Hebrews 4 reminds us we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need.
Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. Christ has shown me that what I once thought was valuable is worthless. Nothing is as wonderful as knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. I have given up everything else and counted all as loss. All I want is Christ and to know that I belong to him. I could not make myself acceptable to God by obeying the laws of Moses. God accepted me simply because of my faith in Christ. All I want is to know Christ and the power that raised him to life. I want to suffer and die as he did so that somehow I also may be raised to life. Please. 
Good morning. Welcome again to worship with us here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. Uh, I have to say uh, to all of you who I can see your wonderful faces this morning, 
I don't think I've ever been so happy to see your wonderful faces this morning. It is great to have folks in the house of the Lord this morning. And I think the best way for us to start is just give a shout of praise to God this morning that we can be here and gather together in worship. Let's give a shout of thanks to the Lord this morning. And we don't want to leave those of you who are uh, watching with us online out this morning. We are so glad that you're gathered with us as well. And we have been so thankful uh, for all that God has done to make it possible uh, for us to be able to be with you every morning from your homes or wherever it is that you're, uh, you're, you're logging in. So it's great to be together with you all. Obviously, in-person worship has resumed here at uh, the church uh, please remember that uh, we are limited to 30 people in the sanctuary each week. Um, so those wishing to attend worship here in person must contact the church office prior to attending uh, a service. And so we'd ask that you'd contact the church office no later than 11 a.m. on the Friday prior to the Sunday that you wish to attend in person. Now, um, if you've already contacted the church office and you've got your Sundays all scheduled, you're good to go. But if you've just kind of been waiting to see how things go and you'd like to try maybe next Sunday, please feel free to contact the church office this week and we can get you set up uh, with some Sundays to attend in person. Uh, Jeannie is sitting there every Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning just waiting for the phone to ring. So um, uh, that's not true. She has a lot of other things she's doing, but uh, she would love to help you uh, schedule those Sundays as well. We are uh, also very excited that uh, we've got a special worship opportunity to share with you all for Ash Wednesday this year. Uh, February 17th, believe it or not, coming up very soon. Uh, we will be gathering for a special praise, prayer, and Lord's Supper service beginning at 6.30 p.m. This special gathering service will be available both in person here in the sanctuary as well as live via Facebook. So um, if, uh, if a Wednesday evening is a time when you're just rolling home at, at 6.30, no worries. Uh, you can join us from your home live via Facebook. But those who would like to come and be together in person, we'd love to have you do that. And that will be a Lord's Supper service also. So please, if you're joining us from home, make sure you've got uh, some juice and bread or something you could use. Uh, to share together the meal with us. As a reminder, this morning's service is also uh, a Lord's Supper service, and so um, if, you, if you can take a second even now, if you forgot, grab uh, some bread and juice or something, um, and we would love to be able to share together with you this morning. Those of you who are in the house of the Lord this morning, um, you should have received two small cups as you walked in this morning. Joyce was back there with her gloves and mask diligently uh, handing those out. And uh, so we're hopeful those will be a lot easier than those tiny little cups we had before. Um, and so we, we're very thankful that we can share together in the Lord's Supper this morning. Um, with that, um, are there any other announcements? Pam, you got anything this morning? Okay. Um, with that, let's um, uh, turn our hearts in prayer to God this morning. Um, you should have received your virtual bulletin this morning, uh, which has uh, a prayer list in it this morning for you. There's also lots of other information about things that are happening this week and so forth. Um, those of you who are here in person, you'll see the, the, the uh, prayer list in your bulletin this morning as well. Would you join me in a time of prayer, then, as we go before our God on behalf of those whom we love? Well, Father God, again, we thank and praise you for this good day that you've given to us. Lord, it is cold outside. It is very cold. But as we sit here in your house this morning, as we sit in our homes, as we feel the warmth, uh, we feel your warmth around us. Father, you've given us just this beautiful sun-shining day to remind us that even in the coldest of times, even in the most difficult of times, even in the most raw and, and painful of times, you are there shining on us. Father, what a great reminder that is for us today. The writer of Hebrews is going to remind us today that you gave us your son, Jesus Christ, who is our only great high priest, who is seated at your right hand, who is there pleading for us, for our case before you. Father, what a joy it is to know a Savior, to know the Savior, Jesus, the one who has 
given all for us. And Father, this morning, our hearts are reminded of so many who are struggling today. Father, there are some who continue to struggle as a result of COVID-19. There are some whose lives have just been completely uprooted. Um, Returning to normal seems like something that just might never happen. There are some who have lost loved ones in the midst of this time. There are others whose loved ones have been hospitalized for long periods of time or short stays. There are those who are in rehab facilities. Father, there are some of our family who who have had surgery and are recovering, who desperately need you to continue to heal them. Father, there are some who are in need of surgery and are, are anxiously awaiting the day when they will be able to receive that. Father, there are some whose relationships are in tatters, where it seems like every day they get one step closer to to ending this relationship. Father, there are some whose uh, financial situation has just become a mess. There are some, Father, who have experienced all of these things. And so, Father, on behalf of our family, this body, these people, hear our cry to you. Hear us as we call and we submit each of these requests before you. Father, David so rightly said that you hear us when we call. The great King David reminded us that in that very difficult time of his life when when all seemed to be just crushing in on him, he stopped and he cried out. And he said, Lord, hear me. And the beautiful way that psalm ends, he says, and you heard my cry. You answered me. So come now, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you hear our cry? Would you hear us when we call to you? Father, would you work in amazing ways in our lives, in the lives of those whom we love and pray for? Father, as we have begun now to reopen this sanctuary, would you fling wide the doors of this place that that we would be able to come and gather and worship together? Father, maybe there are some who have been logging in on Sunday mornings for a long time now, and they have been thinking about coming and joining us. And Father, would you make a way for that to happen? Father, what we're asking for is that you would continue to make our gospel proclamation, the good news of Jesus Christ, at the center of all of we do. Father, we give you thanks for this place, for Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We give you thanks for the staff and for the leadership and the volunteers and all of the people it takes to do the ministry that you've called us to. And so, Father, now as we turn our hearts and our minds to your word, would you then give us the wisdom and the discernment of the Holy Spirit that the word we hear would be falling fresh on our hearts and that we would rightly apply the word that we hear this morning. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for gathering us together in so many different ways this morning. Father, we give this to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Well, brothers and sisters, as we uh, gather under the word of God this morning, I would ask that wherever you are, uh, you would stand as we read together God's word this morning. Reading from the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4 this morning, beginning at verse 14 and reading through chapter 5 and verse 10. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word for this day. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in the matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. And this is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. And so in the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who would obey him. And he was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word to us. You may be seated. But brothers and sisters, it seems to me that throughout the history of the Church of Jesus Christ, I'm talking big C, capital C, Church of Jesus Christ, in its many iterations, in its many settings, there might not have been a more controversial concept adopted by some of Christ's church as the concept of the priesthood. Today, Outside of the Catholic Church and maybe some instances of the Church of England, there are very few instances of Christ's church which practice what we have often called a monastic lifestyle. What I mean here is that there are very few, hardly if any, examples of a clerical priesthood. Men who have left their homes families behind in order to serve God with every minute and every hour of their lives. The online Catholic encyclopedia, the New Advent Encyclopedia, defines the word priest this way. It says, the priest is the minister of divine worship and especially of the highest act of worship, the sacrifice. In this sense, every religion has its priests exercising more or less exalted sacerdotal functions and intermediaries between man and the divine. As Protestant Christians, Christians who believe and worship in the tradition of those who protested against the papacy in the Roman Catholic Church, as Protestant Christians, we don't ascribe the word priest. We don't ascribe to it an official office of the church, nor to any 
particular member of our church or so-called clergy. Even that word clergy has an interesting root. The Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines the word clergy as the body of all people ordained for religious duties, especially in the Christian church. We could, of course, go on and on and on this morning about the use of such words and the elevation of men, and I suppose in some cases women, into the office of priesthood. But I find one problem this morning with that conversation. I so struggle with the idea of a person being lifted up, elevated, for specific religious duties, such as the offering of a sacrifice on behalf of the people, because we find this in the truth of God's word. We find these words. Paul says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. For this is good and it pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And then Paul says this, he says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. There is only one mediator between you and God, Jesus. Here's my point. No man, not me, not some other pastor, not a Catholic priest, no man could ever be counted so righteous as being able to truly mediate between God and his creation. Now you might say, well, how can you be so sure about that? Because I know of the important and devastating impact of sin. The important and devastating impact of sin on every human life has left us in a state we call depravity. A state of moral corruption and wickedness. And Romans chapter 3 and verse 20 reminds us that there is no one righteous. Not even one. Paul goes on to say that There is not one who has turned away from sin and back to God. Instead, every one of us has turned away from God to our own ways, our own thinking, our own power. And that turning away from God renders all of us unworthy. So how could it ever be then that one who is so completely unworthy before God could ever come to such a place or in some cases How could he or she ever be worthy enough to bring the sins of another person before God himself? How could that person ever be so worthy to bring a sacrifice before God? Pastor Charles F. Stanley of First Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia writes, There are not five mediators between God and man, or three, or two. There is only one, and his name is Jesus Christ. No one else qualifies, he says. No one else accepts. And God does not accept anyone else. Only Jesus has the necessary credentials. You know, in Israel's day, though, that wasn't the case, right? In Israel's day, Jesus had not yet been sent by his father to earth. Jesus had not yet been born of flesh and walked this earth and suffered and died for a a crime not his own. Before Jesus, man needed an opportunity for restitution with God to sort of pay back all the debt racked up by their sin. Before Jesus, God did raise up a number of men whom he called the Levites to serve as priests in his temple and to bring sacrifices before him on behalf of his creation, his people. Even still, these priests were insufficient. 
The Levitical priesthood was a band-aid, if you will on the wound of Israel's sin, but they could never possibly bring true and complete healing. Even though sacrifice was made by them, God's wrath was temporarily, at least, appeased on the account of the faithfulness of these Levites. Their temple offerings could never fully repay God. For that devastation that creation had brought on him. The high priest in Israel's day. The high priest in Israel's day held a very esteemed position, but his duties were relatively limited. His only concern was the spiritual health of God's people. The New King James Bible Commentary writes this. It says, In the tabernacle... And later in the temple, the priests mediated between God and the Israelites by offering animal sacrifices to atone for the sins of the people and by interceding to God for the nation. In their position as mediators, the priests were the only ones eligible to enter the holy place. The place where God had made his presence known. The one mediator is the man Jesus Christ. There is one God from whom salvation is available. There is only one way to him. Through that mediator, Christ Jesus, who has the full nature of God and the full nature of man. One and only way. Only one could ever save us. Only one could ever be worthy enough to go before the Father and plead for forgiveness and redemption and restoration for the people of God. That one, that only one must be Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It has to be Jesus because he alone is without sin. Only Jesus looked straight into Satan's eyes and never so much as even blinked. Only Jesus experienced the pain and the torment of this world and and never so much as even let out a whisper about it. Pastor John MacArthur writes that the high priest was a specialist in representing humanity to God. He was never a politician nor a social worker. His work was always to bring the people of God closer to God. That's it. The role of the human priest, the Levitical priests, was simple. Bring the attention of God's creation, God's people, back on God. Well, at least their role was simple when we say it, right? Right? But in reality, that role is incredibly difficult. The reality of their office as priests of God was to do this. You know, so much gets in the way of attention making. Attention shifting work. Not the least of which those things that get in the way is is selfishness, pride, arrogance, greed, lust, sensuality, discontentment. God's people couldn't find satisfaction among the things that stood right before their eyes. So how in the world could they ever be content with a God who was unseen? So the priests were to bring the attention of the people back to the God who is otherwise unseen. By the time we get to the development of the Roman Catholic Church, sometime after the end of the first century AD, not very much has changed, by the way. The Roman way of faith would lead the creation of many earthbound regulations, I guess, or uh, accommodations, requirements, changes to what Jesus had originally spoken and taught about the way of righteousness. These rules, in most cases, were nothing more than accommodations or, yeah, accommodations for the continued sinfulness and the turning away of God's people. It was brand new sinners 
but still the same sin. Well, the development of the priesthood and ultimately the development of something called the papacy, the line of men who have served as, as, uh, quote unquote, the vicar of Christ or the pope of the Roman Catholic Church, it was nothing more than yet another accommodation. The papacy provided an earthly authority for the people, albeit supposedly overseen and established by God. This papacy, this earthly authority, would come in handy for solving arguments, for coming to the resolution of a dispute, to administrate the church, and of course, to determine and administer all things sacred and holy and good. The New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia again suggests this. It says, The priest is the person authoritatively appointed to do homage to God in the name of society, even the primitive society of the family, and to offer to him sacrifice. Listen, friends, brothers and sisters, I don't want to belabor the point this morning. I don't want to seem as though I am degrading our Catholic friends. I don't want to seem as though I'm attempting to besmudge the name of their church. I am not. However, together with the writer of Hebrews, I must today be certain to tell you this. I must urge you to understand there is no need for a priesthood of men, for there is only one great high priest, and his name is Jesus. There is but one great high priest that men and women of faith have ever and will ever need. He does not wear a clerical collar. He is not robed in colorful vestments. He does not attend to those seeking to confess sin in a small box with a sliding door. He is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. Where he is pleading for, praying for, all those whom, as Paul said, have confessed the name of Jesus Christ and believed in their heart that he has been risen from the grave. And as such, there is not now nor will there ever be a man so worthy of the things of God that he should be elevated above all other men. As if to suggest that this man was somehow holier than we are. Closer to God than we are. More able to present sacrifice before God than Jesus Christ. Who was, by the way, the one final and perfect sacrifice. The church has no need for earthly mediators between God and man. Because the one perfect mediator is already working for his church. Therefore, the writer of Hebrews today encourages us to hold firmly to the faith that we profess, recognizing that our one great high priest is not unfamiliar with our earthly troubles. And so in confidence then approach the throne of grace, the throne of God. There's no need to send in the priest or the pastor on your behalf this morning. God desires to know you. God desires to converse with you and to work in your life. God desires to know you, speak to you, and work through you. Not someone who is supposedly holier than you. Let me remind you of Hebrews chapter 5. Starting at verse 1, the writer says, Every high priest is selected from among the people and appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for the sins of the people. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. 
And this is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. That's the sort of earthly understanding of priesthood. And so the writer says, okay, great. Now let's talk about Jesus. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but rather God said to him, the Father, the creator of all things, said to him, you are my son, today I've become your father. And he says in another place, you are the priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And then the writer says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save us from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered and, and once made perfect. Right? Jesus, perfect. Once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who would obey him. And he was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus alone is the source of eternal salvation for all who would obey him. He alone is our great high priest. Therefore, I would offer to you this morning three problems with the way that much of our society elevates the office of priest or pastor. The first problem is this. The idea that a mere man could ever be counted worthy enough to carry the sins of his fellow brothers and sisters to God. That a mere man could be worthy enough to carry the sins of his fellow brothers and sisters. I've already mentioned Paul's words in Romans 3, which reminds us that there is not one person among us who is righteous. There is not one who is worthy. Only Jesus Christ is both righteous and worthy. And only Jesus Christ could be sufficient enough to repay our debt and win back our lives from the pit of death, which is where we were assigned to on account of our sin. You see, the process of selecting the next pope in the line of the Roman Catholic popes is something which I have always followed. I've always found it very fascinating. I wait for the white smoke in the Abemus Papum, right? Now, I do this not because I agree with the concept of the papacy, nor because I find a necessity for it, but it absolutely fascinates me because here we have this college of cardinals who will spend days, sometimes weeks, maybe even a month or more, discerning who it is that is worthy enough to be called de proinde pater, the Holy Father. What takes this group of elite religious officials, weeks to determine, took Jesus but three short days to prove once and for all. Let me make sure you heard that. What takes this group of religious officials, weeks to prove, took Jesus just three short days to prove. There is no one righteous. There is no one holy enough. There's no one else but Jesus himself. He is prophet, priest, and king. Now the second problem that I see with the way that much of our society elevates the office of priest is that some people place their priest or their pastor on a pedestal, elevating them to a place of special, better, more influence with God. Is it to say somehow or another the pastor or priest is closer to God? When I was first called to serve as the shepherd of this gathered body of God's people, there were a goodly number of expectations placed upon me. There were expectations about what I would say when we gathered for worship. There were expectations about what this body would do what we would say, what we would sing, how we would sing. There were even expectations regarding what I would wear when we gathered together in this place. 
For most, I'd say, of the first 12 months or more of my tenure here, I wore a robe every Sunday morning. It wasn't really a big deal to me. The pastor of the church where I grew up was robed every Sunday. But soon I began to notice a significant problem with something so simple as the pastor's robe. For some people, the robe that the pastor wears was a signal, a sign of holiness. And therefore, only those who were holy enough or maybe even righteous enough, are afforded the opportunity to don such a robe. And I began to sense that when I had accepted the call to these people to serve, to lead, to guide, I was immediately elevated to some sort of a higher position, that I had been placed on a pedestal where only those who were holier than thou are allowed to stand. But I need to assure you of this one truth this morning, brothers and sisters. I am not now, nor will I ever be, holier than anyone. I remember a conversation with my dear brother, a man who has mentored me in countless ways. His name is Steve Christ. I had simply decided that I was done wearing my robe. I was going to reserve it for special times like weddings and funerals, but I wouldn't be wearing it for regular weekly services any longer. I just shared that decision with the council, who surprisingly took it much better than I expected. After the meeting, Steve took me to the side and he said, listen, Jeremy, this is going to work out fine. But you just got to allow yourself to not become too comfortable. Not become too casual. Because, yeah, you're not holier than any of us. But we also need to be reminded that you are someone that we can trust. That we, you are someone we can look to for guidance and rely upon. And so too casual, he said, might suggest that you frankly just don't care. I never forgot that conversation. In fact, that conversation replays in my head every Sunday morning when I go to the closet and I try to figure out what I'm going to wear that day. In churches all over the world, you see folks are still putting their priests and their pastors on these pedestals, placing these men who seek to serve and love them just far enough out of reach that, well... Maybe we don't have to build a relationship together. If the priest or the pastor is worthy of a pedestal, then the priest or the pastor is better than me, holier than me. And I think, hopefully, he won't waste his time focusing his attention on me. Therefore, I can just show up, pay up, And hopefully go up. I refuse to settle for a relationship with the people of God whom I have been called to love and care for. That is nothing more than ceremonial. I don't want to be on any kind of a pedestal. By the way, look what happens when I stand on things that are high up, right? I go crashing down to the ground. Only Jesus is worthy of the pedestal. I want to try to be like Jesus as I serve you. I, like Jesus, want to know my sheep. 
I want them to know that I'm a shepherd called for them. I want to laugh with you. I want to cry with you. I want to commiserate with you in your frustration. I want to experience life together with you. And I want to see it all from the same level as you right here on the ground with you. The third problem with the way that much of our society elevates the office of priest is this. Many folks count their pastor or their priest as the ultimate authority on all things God. Now, this point is admittedly complex because on one hand, yes, I pray that your pastor is for you a source of discernment and wisdom If you cannot visit your pastor to seek his help in discerning God's will or to find answers to questions or concerns that you have in matters of faith, then who is it that you can go to? Even still, and I need you to listen closely to the words that I'm about to speak to you this morning, even still, your pastor is not always right. Your pastor gets it wrong sometimes. Your pastor misunderstands, misreads, and misinterprets God's word just like you do. This simple truth, however, need not discredit his work entirely. Simply because your pastor isn't always right doesn't mean he is never right, okay? Still, there is quite a significant difference between seeking a religious advisor who can discern with you and alongside of you the things of God and expecting your pastor or your priest to be the final authority on all things God. In my own case, there is admittedly much that I do not know when it comes to God and his will and his way. It just means that I'm not a walking Jesus encyclopedia. Doesn't mean that I can't search out the answer with you. Doesn't mean that I can't seek God for discernment with you. It just means that I am not Encyclopedia Brown Jesus version. Many times when we're sitting under God's word together like we are this morning, I am learning right alongside you. And by the way, that's perfectly fine that we're learning together. There was a wise man who probably said it best. He said that the best teacher is the one who takes away as much, if not more, from his lesson as his his pupils do. If the teacher isn't learning when he's teaching, what is he doing? When I was in college, a favorite professor of mine had an incredible memory. He always had a knack for memorization from an early age. In his teenage years, he set out on this mission to memorize the entire Bible. When I sat in his classes, he was beyond the normal age of retirement. And though he had certainly memorized, I'm going to say, most of God's word, he had still never been able to memorize the entire thing. Was he some kind of failure? Definitely not. Now, did the fact that there were portions of Scripture that he had not memorized render all of his other work failures and worthless? No. All that his incomplete memorization proved was that he too, just like all of us sitting in his class, was human. He too was imperfect. I am not now, nor will I ever be perfect. Well, maybe I will when Jesus comes and we all gather together in heaven, but so will you. All that I strive for is that my offering before you would be a living sacrifice to God and that he would find my sacrifice acceptable and pleasing. If I've said it once, I've said it a million times, God never, ever demands perfection from you or I, but he always demands that we would bring him our very best in every moment. So if God does not expect perfection or place unachievable expectations on us, why do so many church members place such expectations on their pastors? I am not the final authority on all things God, brothers and sisters. But I do know him who is. 
as a means of offering to you some sort of conclusion and application to this message this morning. Let me clarify what I've already said a moment ago. God never places expectations on anyone which are unattainable. He may very well place expectations on you and I that seem impossible apart from him helping us. Our feeble human minds, wisdom and power might fail us. But that's probably the perfect time to remind us all what God promises in his word. That nothing is impossible with God. So scripture makes this one thing very clear. God is always the final authority. And Jesus Christ always has the final word. God is always the final authority. Jesus Christ always has the final word. You want to know more about this? You're looking for answers? Are you tired of people telling you, well, I don't know? Then why not go directly to the source? Why not have a conversation with God? In generations past, some would have said that we cannot, we must not go before God ourselves. In fact, as we've already discussed, God mandated that Israel, his people Israel, would not come before him on their own, but rather that they would come before him through the mediation of the Levites, the Levitic, Levitical priests. But we must remember that was before Jesus. That was before God gave to us the one that the writer of Hebrew, Hebrews now calls our great high priest. That was before God gave all of his glory to his son, Jesus Christ. It was before we literally, as John says, saw the glory of the one and only Father, full of grace and truth, standing before us. So the truth is this. The tribe of Levi, the priests of God's temple, were inferior. They were insufficient, just like you and I. And that's why Jesus had to be the trade for the tribe of priests. That's why God had to tear the curtain that hid the Ark of the Covenant and break the table of the Lord into two when Jesus died. Insufficient, imperfect sinners could never be worthy of bringing a, a worthy sacrifice before God. Let alone bringing the sin of others. So very quickly, three application points for you. The first is this, the tribe of Levi were called to serve as the representatives of the people before God, but even their ways became corrupt. We live in Illinois. We know what the word corrupt means, right? Therefore, God replaced the corrupt Levitical priests with just one priest from Judah. His name is Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 reminds us that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The second application point for you today is this. The Levitical priests offered sacrifices of many kinds, but Jesus offered just one sacrifice for every kind of sin. Himself. Therefore, Jesus is the full and final sacrifice. No other sacrifice could ever be better. A woman by the name of Caroline Anderson, who is a missionary in Southeast Asia and serves on the Southern Baptist Convention's International Missions Board, wrote a 2017 devotional blog post that said this, As Christians, we are able to enter God's presence at any time and in any place because we have been redeemed through Christ's sacrifice. Goats and calves were not sufficient, so he, Jesus, entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Jesus' sacrifice ushered a system whereby we don't gain God's affections through our attempts at righteousness. Faith in the risen Christ is all we need for unfettered access to God who permanently views us through the lens of his son's righteousness. Well, the Apostle Paul said almost the same thing as he was confessing Jesus Christ before the most powerful members of Rome's elite powerful classes. He reminded them, he said, Jesus is the stone you builders have rejected. But he has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. 
Do you ever wonder why only Catholics refer to their worship service as a mass? Because Catholic theology proclaims what takes place on the altar of the Eucharist when the church is gathered together for worship is the utmost importance for believers in their life. For there, on the altars of those many churches, Jesus is sacrificed once again, over and over, for the continued sins of his people. As if he was nothing more than the average lamb or goat brought to the temple to atone for those present sins of the people. But Jesus is not some average lamb. He is instead the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who trust in Him. He is the perfect spotless Lamb, the only perfect spotless Lamb who suffered and died in your place once and for all for every sacrifice. Therefore, we have no need of an altar. We have no further need of sacrifice. Jesus Christ calls us to gather with Him together at His table and to taste and see how good and gracious our God is. Just how good and gracious is our God? Application point three. The Levitical priests all died. Every single man who serves as a priest or a pastor will also die. I will die. But Jesus, the great high priest, though he once was dead, the writer of Hebrews tells us, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He has risen from the grave just as he said he would. He has ascended now on high. He sits at the right hand of God, his Father, where he is right now, this very moment, pleading for you and for your life. When that great day comes and Christ comes as the white rider on the horse to rescue us all home and rapture us up with him forever, we will stand in judgment before the God of all creation. But we will stand before the mercy seat of Jesus Christ, the suffering servant, perfect and final sacrifice. Instead of standing before the great white throne of judgment, we will stand before the ever merciful, ever compassionate, ever forgiving mercy seat of Jesus Christ. And when the Father recalls our sin, it will be Jesus who will speak for us. It will be Jesus who knows the truth of our need and our troubles and has felt our sorrow. It will be Jesus who will cry out to his Father, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And listen, I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but when that day comes, I am sure enough relieved that in that moment, it will be Jesus, not some pastor or some priest, who will be standing and speaking for me. For he alone is our great high priest. So, the writer of Hebrews says, let us hold Firmly to the faith which we profess. In Jesus Christ, our great high priest and our savior. Amen. Amen. The writer of Hebrews reminds us, son though he was, he learned obedience from the things that he suffered. And once he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all of those who would obey him. This morning, I invite you to gather together at the table with us. This is not my table. This is not Cornerstone Faith Community Church's table. 
Miss Joyce puts together a great spread for communion every week. It's not Miss Joyce's table. This is the table of Jesus Christ, our great high priest. And he has invited you to come and gather together with him here to taste and see how good and gracious our God is. He has invited you to be reminded that at this table, Yes, we experience the death of Jesus again. But we, didn't, we, don't, we don't crucify him again. We don't sacrifice him again. He was the one final sacrifice. So when we gather here, we gather in remembrance of him. Who is all we could ever need. Who has paid the debt and won the prize for us. Paul reminds us, right, that when we gather at the table, as Jesus invites us here, if we gather here and we haven't taken a moment to consider our hearts, to consider the sin in our lives and the condition of our souls before God our Father, then when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we take it as judgment. I've always wondered what that exactly means, and about the best I can think of is, is it's like, you remember that? medicine the doctor used to give you and it would make you feel better but man it almost make you want to because it tasted so bad when we don't consider our sin this meal tastes bad so let us consider our sin before God this morning I'm going to give you a moment of silence to pray on your own Asking God to cleanse your heart of the sin. And then we'll pray together. Well, Father God... You are the only great high priest. Your son, Jesus Christ, is the only one who could ever be worthy of such a, an honor, such a title. Because it was your son, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to the bitter end. He came willingly like a lamb before the slaughter. He didn't say a word. He just went. He knew the task that was at hand. He knew the weight and the amount of our debt that we had racked up before you in our sinfulness. And just like every other man in his humanness, he prayed that you would find some other way. But in his divinity, he knew there was no other way. He must go. And so he went to the cross to remove our sin. Father, your word tells us that those who trust in Jesus are made happy. They are blessed. There is no blessing other than the blessing of Jesus. There is no blessing that you have not given to us, Father. And yet so many times in our lives we see other things that look better, that look easier, that look like more fun. And so we choose those things instead of you, the blessing. And then we find ourselves once again, Father, down this road, bumpy, thorny, full of potholes. And right there, as it seems like we're about to walk off the cliff, you come and you rescue us. God, who are we? Who are we that you would be mindful of us, that you would care so much for us that you would send your son, Jesus Christ, to save us? Who are we? Your word tells us that we are absolutely someone special to you. You have called us your child. And Jesus has called us friend. And so, Father, we lay before you the multitude of our sins, the things we've done, the things we've left undone, the words we've said, the words we should have said, 
the thoughts of our minds. Father, we ask you to forgive us. Cleanse us with a rod of hyssop that we would be made white as snow. Oh, Father, how we desperately need you. We are so thankful today that your word has been fulfilled in Jesus, and so we know how this story ends. We know that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, when we confess our sin before you, you are faithful and just, and you forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And while, Father, we will not be holy or righteous before one another in this place, in that moment when you have cleansed us, we are righteous and holy before you. And so, Father, we give you thanks and praise for this. Help us, heal us, comfort us, and defend us. We ask this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let me remind you that on the night when our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat, for this is my body which has been broken for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat, brothers and sisters. After they had eaten together, Jesus then took a cup and he poured it for them. And he said, Brothers, drink of this cup. For this cup is the cup of the new covenant which is shed in my blood for the remission of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink of this cup in remembrance of me. Take and drink.
brothers and sisters in Christ, hear this good news. Know this truth, that whenever we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen? Will you stand and worship together with us? Through the sunset spring, all is free. O child of God, come now before the Lord, the God of all creation. Having been fed and nourished by him, having been reminded of the sin that separates us from God our Father, but having been renewed in the truth, power in the presence of the gospel of Jesus Christ that as far as the east is from the west so far has God removed your sin from you Father we give you thanks and praise in this house and wherever we are gathered this morning for the good news of Jesus Christ that there is no other name by which we must be saved so let us then Confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead for us. Amen? Amen. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, as you prepare to leave the house of the Lord this morning, wherever it is you're joining together with us, would you go then with this blessing? Would you go with the love of God our Father? the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to be with you this day and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings